Hey, well, good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you. Good to be here to worship together. Uh, just remember, I want to encourage if you have a prayer request or a need, make sure and fill out the communication card there in your, in your bulletin. And uh, as always, uh, for those who are watching on Facebook this morning, if you could just uh, leave a comment or check in to let us know who's watching with you. Also, if you have a prayer request, you can leave that for us as well. So I want to make sure if you took a tag for the giving tree, make sure and get that back as soon as possible. If you want the opportunity to give toward African Pregnancy Services and all the tags were taken, uh, feel free to grab. Uh, diapers are always a great uh, resource that they are in need of. So remember, little diapers, newborns, ones and twos, they will take those and give those to families in need. Uh, one other thing that I want you to note in your bulletin, uh, make sure, and if you are interested, we are going to do uh, Christmas caroling, socially distanced Christmas caroling this year. Uh, we got a lot of folks that we think we can really encourage and, and bless uh, with that ministry, and so that is going to be here in a couple of weeks, and we're going to be here at the church at 5 p.m.? Yes. 5 p.m. All right, so something fun to do with the family, and a great thing for the Christmas season. Let's go ahead and stand this morning as we turn our hearts, our attitudes toward the scriptures today and align them with the Lord. Our scripture reading today is from Luke chapter 12, verse 35 and following. Lord Jesus says, be dressed ready for service and keep your lamps burning. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. So that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the second or third watch of the night. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not let, have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect it. Let's be ready and prepared for the return of our Lord. Let's pray this morning. Father in heaven, God, it is good to gather with like-minded believers. Father, may we be unified in the bond of, of peace and the unity of your spirit, Lord. Fathers, we sing not only with our voices, but with our hearts as we lift the name of our Lord Jesus high today. We seek to honor him. We seek to emulate him. Father, Grant us by your grace to continue to walk in faithfulness and truth, to worship in spirit and in truth today. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.
I love that song and how it uh, just reminds us of the choir and the chorus that will be in heaven as we stand before the throne. We got one more coming up that uh, really speaks to that, but I wanted to bring us to the cross this morning too, that we might see our Savior who has just reached out his arms and just to bless us, to endure that, to, to show us how much he loved us.
jump right in to the word today. Father in heaven, Lord, move as your word is read and proclaimed today. Father, may your spirit, we ask that you'll stir us up, Lord, to serve you with a greater degree of faithfulness and affection, to deepen our passion. Father, my prayer is simply that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, Lord, will be pleasing in your sight alone. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. There are two police officers who responded to a dispatch call about a terrible accident. And so they showed up on the scene before the ambu ambulances arrived. And it looked like there was a family in the car and, and they were all unconscious, unconscious at the moment. It's a bad accident. And so as soon as the ambulance arrived, they were able to begin loading uh, the, the people. But they didn't know how the accident happened. They couldn't figure out what was going on on, on the scene, trying to investigate, but just kind of coming up short, really clueless. Then they discovered there was a monkey standing out beside the car. I said, well, we can't interview anybody else, but I said, well, let's interview the monkey. I'm sure, you know, Warren knows what that's like, you know, interviewing a few monkeys trying to figure out the scene, right? Yeah. You know, but that's just, uh, that's the way it is. And so they got this monkey, they're going to interview him. They said, I, do you know what the dad was doing? The monkey gestures like this. <laughs> well, that makes a lot of sense. This is why there's an accident. They said, you know what the mom was doing? <laughs> that makes a lot of sense too. What are the kids doing in the back seat? 
Now, they were fighting. And at least after this, all makes perfect sense. You know, we got dad was drinking, mom was yelling, the kids were fighting. It's terrible. And what were you doing? You know, and the monkey says this. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself, but hey, I'll come back to it. Some of you may know uh, author and motivational speaker Ken Blanchard. You're probably familiar with his book, One Minute Manager. A number of years ago, Ken Blanchard became a follower of Jesus, and he became convinced out of all the leaders of all time that Jesus was the unequivocally best leader in history. It's hard to miss for any of us. We agree, right? But Jesus was the best leader, best example to follow. And we, we discovered that here in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. Verse 21 says, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow. Jesus is not only the Savior of our souls, He's not only the Creator of the universe, the Lord and the Master, but He is also the example, the one in whom you are to follow in His footsteps. Now about the same time Kim Blanchard was discovering leadership lessons from Jesus, uh, Jim Collins, who is a non-Christian, you may know this name as well, best-selling book called From Good to Great. You familiar with that one? So they're writing these books about the same time in history. And Jim Collins researched a number of top-level organizations. I mean, these are the organizations doing the best in, in America. He looked, he surveyed, said, what makes them great? Well, it was they had a top-level leader. And Collins listed the number one ingredient of the great organization. He said it was a level five leader. A level five leader is someone who leads the organization with confidence, who is certain of where they should go, who casts a vision and then goes in that direction. What he found was the most effective long term leaders are not these giant, you know, larger than life personalities. You know, they weren't these people that just, just stood out like sore thumbs because of their greatness. He said, typically, the level five leader is quiet. He's humble. Doesn't mind working behind the scenes. He's gracious. He's reserved. He's mild-mannered. He said, but the level five leader is also very ambitious. He's motivated and driven, but not for his own sake. He's not caught up in what, what he's not egotistically driven, but he is organizationally driven. He sold out to the organization, pours his heart and soul into it. You know who a level five leader sounds a whole lot like? Sounds a whole lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Now, the other side of the coin is that business leaders don't really emphasize the Bible. Uh, it's something in the Bible that the Bible talks about quite a bit. Now, we find... You know, in, in the scriptures, we find effective leaders within, but it also teaches us how to be effective followers. The scriptures teach us how to be effective leaders and followers. And part of my aim this morning is to make sure that we're not a dysfunctional family with a monkey behind the wheel, okay? You know, that's, that's part of my aim. But to have a church body filled with leaders and followers who are sold out to the mission of Jesus Christ. Who are committed to see this church succeed for the glory of God alone. Not for our egos, not to, to have a name for ourselves, but that Jesus would be the name that's made known here. So Peter gives us this treasure trove. If you're in 1 Peter chapter 5, it's a treasure trove packed with, with just information, with details on how to be an effective leader, but also an effective follower. So we're going to look at both sides of that coin this morning because that's what Peter does. How to be an effective leader and an effective follower. So we'll begin uh, with looking at what does a Christian leader look like? Because that's what Peter does. Chapter 5, verse 1. Look at it with me. Peter says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So we jump right in here and Peter addresses elders in particular, right? 
He's got a message for all of us, and that's what I want you to catch here. So men, women, young, old, he's got a message for us, but he addresses the elders in particular. And I want to show you that there are, in, in the church, there are other leaders as well. We know that. There are deacons, there are teachers, there are staff members, there are scores of volunteers who make things happen on, on a daily basis, right? Amen. To make sure that we're here and we're worshiping together well. So here's what I want to encourage you with this morning. As we read this text, I want to challenge you, to all the men who are listening in particular, whether God is calling you to be an elder in the future or not, the kind of man who is described as an elder in the Word of God is the kind of man that God is calling you to be. Whether you bear that title now or ever, God is calling you to be that kind of man. And most of these traits to be that kind of woman as well. A godly follower of Jesus Christ. And I also want to challenge you because this is something that if you're thinking about maybe God is calling me to be a, a leader or elder in the church in the future. This is something that I want you to pay very careful attention to as we study it today. So Paul or Peter addresses the elders, right? The elders among you. These are the men who are spiritually mature. They're called overseers, right? They oversee the affairs of the church. God intends for the elders, there to be elders in every body of Christ. You can read more about elders, eldership in the book of Acts, 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1. But this morning we're going to stick primarily to 1 Peter. Now here at Southwest we have five elders. We have five elders with Gene Ross, Russ Mercer, Gary and Chuck Weinsheimer, and Jim Brummer. And they've been put forth by the congregation, nominated among us, and we've selected them and set them apart to lead the church spiritually. As we go along, I want to challenge you to do a couple of things. Now that you know who these guys are, if you didn't already, right? Pray for these men. That they would lead well. That they would lead in spirit and in truth. And with the best interests of Jesus in their hearts. In their minds. Nothing else. But also, to set your aspirations on becoming that kind of man in your life as well. Now, certainly not all Christian men are called to be elders, but all Christian men are called to exemplify the characteristics of an elder in their lives. Those character traits. So let's talk about, first of all, uh, an elder's responsibilities. If you're taking notes, you can jot this down. An elder's responsibilities. This is what God has called them to do. Uh, number one, look at verse two. Peter says, be shepherds or shepherd God's flock. That is under your care. What does it mean to shepherd the flock? Well, number one, an elder is to feed the sheep. And oftentimes the Bible refers to God's followers, Christ's followers, the, the church as, as being sheep. And he, he is our chief shepherd, right? That Jesus is the chief shepherd of the church. And really what elders function as are these under shepherds who are answerable to the chief shepherd for leading the church. You know, the scripture in the 23rd Psalms paints such a vivid picture. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? Want. When the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want. Why? Because he leads you to quiet pastures. The verse is so rich and beautiful. When I read it, I think of a sheep. Whose guy's belly is so full. You know, kind of like Thanksgiving. Hope you had a happy Thanksgiving. But he feels so safe because the shepherd is near. They can just lay down and go right to sleep. Think how anxious we get sometimes. How worried and stressed and hurried we get in life sometimes that 
we lay our heads down and we just lay there awake because we're fretting or we're concerned about things that we can't control, but we want to control. Well, someone who is in the care of the shepherd needs to realize you're in the care of the shepherd. You can lay down knowing the shepherd has got it all under control. He is sovereign. He is good. And he is watching out for your best interest, beloved. No matter what's going on circumstantially around you, it can be a storm around you, but in the presence of the shepherd, you can rest and you can feed well on a diet of his word. He wants you to be well fed on his word. Jesus said in Matthew chapter four, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Right. What is that? That's the scriptures. You don't, you don't live on bread alone. You don't live on chips and salsa alone, right? You don't live on whatever, food alone. You live on a steady, healthy diet of the Word of God. When I think of hungry people, I think they're... How do you feel when you're hungry? You irritable? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hangry, that's the word, right? You get restless. If you don't eat long enough, you get weak and tired. Well-fed people, though, are, tend to be more cooperative. They tend to be stronger, more content. Oftentimes, I believe there's a restlessness in the church today because people are not fed a steady diet of the Word of God. Divided in truth. Clarity, application for living and following Jesus faithfully. But you also have to feed yourself the Word of God, right? You can't have a teacher or a preacher there with you uh, every day to, to feed you the Word of God. But you need to eat. How often? Every day. To maintain a healthy life. Dr. Beryl Tenney, great theologian. He said, if you want to draw a cup of cold water, you got to dig a deep well. An elder who is faithful to the scriptures will be an elder who studies the scriptures daily. Not just the newspaper, but studies the scriptures daily, shares it with others, and above all, lives by the truths within. Second, elders, they're first to feed the sheep, but second, they need to bleed for the sheep. A shepherd must be willing to bleed for the sheep. Paul told the elders in Ephesus, Acts chapter 20, he said, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as an overseer to shepherd the church of God. Right? Echoing what Peter said, shepherd the church of God, but you've got to be on your guard. Remember, Christ purchased it with his own blood. So you've got to know that you might have to spill your own blood in caring for the flock. Verse 29. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Men will rise up even from your own number and distort the truth to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore, be on the alert. Elders are responsible for protecting the church from enemies. Oftentimes those enemies come from without, from outside, don't they? Like wolves coming in to destroy the flock. Listen, someone may be a great orator. They may be a highly effective communicator. They might be uh, smoothly persuasive. But if their doctrine is not built on the word of God, they're a false teacher. And so elders have to know the scriptures in order to combat false teaching. Oftentimes in scripture, the enemies of God are depicted as uh, those who wanted to lead this, the, the church, I guess you could say, or, or God's people away from the truth. Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 5 condemns false teachers because they allowed, and here's what it says, they allowed his people to be scattered. Can you imagine a wolf running into... A herd of sheep, and there's no shepherd. What's going to happen? The sheep are going to run in every possible direction. There will be no unity. It will be complete chaos, won't it? And that's why the shepherd has to be prepared to strike at the wolf in order to protect the flock. 
Now here Paul warns the Ephesian elders of the exact same thing. Now sadly, the, the, the problem can come from within the church as well. Could be someone who is ego-driven. Sees themselves as first or sees themselves as most important among the others. They're ambitious for power or control or authority and they'll do anything to get it. Steamroll people in order to have it. Or they may simply want to tear others down. There are those in the church who, who love gossiping and they love slandering and they love running people down to make themselves feel better. And that's dangerous to the body of Christ. If a small group leader begins to teach that Jesus isn't God, he should be disciplined, right? If a staff member gets involved in immoral activity, he should be disciplined. If a church member begins to spread vicious gossip that's hurting people's lives and destroying people's faith, they ought to be confronted and disciplined by the eldership. So you can see it's not a job or a calling for the faint of heart, is it? Because elders in the scriptures are called to be sacrificial. Right? They're called to lay their lives down in a way to protect the body of Christ. To put others ahead of themselves. So it cannot be an ego driven ministry. It's got to be a selfless driven ministry. An others driven ministry. Because I've got to be willing to take lumps for the body of Christ. I've got to be willing to bleed for the church in order to be an elder. So number three. Elders have a responsibility to lead the sheep. Feed the sheep. Bleed for the sheep. And lead the sheep. To shepherd is to lead. You can't drive sheep, can you? You got to lead them. If you try to drive them, they scatter. They go in all sorts of directions. Sheep have to have someone to follow, to show the way to go, and then to go in it, and to lead that way. Peter says shepherds are to be examples to the flock. You know what that word means in the Greek? In the original language, it means shepherds are to be a mold after which others can be stamped and patterned after. That's a pretty high calling, isn't it? It's like the Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. That's what an elder ought to be able to say. Follow me as I follow Jesus and I'm going to make many followers of Jesus and lead them to follow my footsteps. So good leaders lead by example. They don't just bark commands like a tiny dictator in their own little kingdom. It just doesn't work that way. Do you like to have commands barked at you? Anybody here? Right? Nobody? But if you've got an example to follow, a trustworthy, godly example, aren't you willing to follow in those footsteps? I know I am. We don't ask you to do something that the elders and church leaders are not willing to do ourselves. As an elder, they must be willing to go in the way and to lead in that way. Look at verse 2. So elders feed, bleed for, and lead the sheep. Now we're going to look at four characteristics of being a good shepherd. Okay. So first is kind of the responsibilities, the work. But if you're going to work at it, you've got to be a type of person in order. You got to, so this is the kind of person you've got to be if you want to be an effective leader leading in that way and leading and feeding in that way. So number one is this. Look at verse two. Serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. God wants you as an overseer to be willing to oversee. So number one, God has called you to this position. We just read in Acts chapter 20, the, the apostle said that God had appointed the overseers for that position. Now being a church elder is a tedious task. It's hard work sometimes. Long meetings, heated arguments sometimes. You know, difficult decisions to be made at times. It is definitely not for the faint of heart. It's a thankless job. Sometimes it's demanding. 
The reason you should be willing to serve is not because you're being pressured, not because your arm's behind your back and you're being, your arms being twisted into serving, but you should serve not out of compulsion, but willingly. Willingly because you love the church. If a man doesn't love the church, he can't lead the church. If a man doesn't love the Lord, he can't lead the Lord's people. If a man can't serve others, he should not be an overseer. Let's look at the next phrase. Let's finish that verse 2. Look what it says. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve. The second kind of person that we're looking for to be an overseer is they must be unselfish and enthusiastic. Unselfish and enthusiastic. Listen, if people feel like they're being taken advantage of, if I feel like I'm being taken advantage of, I am not going to have enthusiastic followers. Right? I'm not going to be an enthusiastic follower if I feel like I'm being taken advantage of. The most effective leader will never exploit people. He's not greedy for money. He is looking out for the best interest of people. Followers of Jesus. Listen, Jesus motivated thousands, didn't he? Thousands and thousands thronged to hear what he had to say, to witness his miracles. And guess what? The Son of Man, oftentimes, the Bible says he had no place to lay his head. He's not greedy. So we're looking for unselfish leaders who are enthusiastic about following Jesus. And enthusiastic about his church. Verse 3 says, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So third, we're looking for shepherds who will be shapers or molders of people. Elders are to be overseers, not overlords. In other words, we're looking for leaders who can be copied and emulated. Leaders who motivate people by example. Not by force of threat. Are you motivated if somebody threatens you? I'm motivated to do the exact opposite of what somebody threatens to do, you know, when somebody threatens me. My flesh talking there, but but I am motivated in my heart to follow somebody that I know is worth following because they're following Jesus well. So bullies need not apply to be church elders. They do not belong there. They don't strong arm people into, into things. They lovingly lead people into following Jesus. Even Peter got it. Right? Peter could have stood on a pedestal and said, Listen, everybody, I am one of Jesus' right hand men. Right? Got the name tag to prove it. Right? <laughs> lead the church in Jerusalem. Don't have to repeat that twice, right? I am the man. Inner circle kind of guy. You should listen to me. You must listen to me. No, he said, instead, in verse 1, I appeal to you as a fellow elder. That's humility, isn't it? You miss the humility there. You're not paying attention. Who Peter was and the way Peter addressed these men shows the character in Peter's heart. Right on their level. Look, you're, we're fellow elders together. And I'm appealing to you. Verse 4. It says, when the chief shepherd appears, right? Who's that? Uh, the boss man, right? Yeah. The chief shepherd, he points out. The Lord Jesus appears. You will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. So fourthly, good shepherds are kingdom focused. This, take a look around, ladies and gentlemen, is not the kingdom. This is the building in which the body of Christ is meeting in. These little acreage here is not the kingdom. And a godly church leader is focused on the kingdom of God, the unseen spiritual kingdom of God of which men and women com are comprised in the body of Christ. Advancing the gospel. Now sometimes a shepherd has to make tough decisions. A shepherd has to know, I'm not going to please everybody all the time. I mean, if you got the attitude that I can please everybody, guess what? That's what you're going to be known as a people pleaser. 
Instead, we want elders who are, first of all, God pleasers. Who want to please Jesus Christ above all else, not man. Now, if you're looking to be an elder because you're focused on your own preferences, if an elder is in the position because he thinks I'm in this position so that I can get what I want, so that I can get the style that I want or the color that I want or the, uh, you know, the building that I want. I'm in this position so that I can control things and keep them the way that I want. You will never, this elder will never allow the Holy Spirit to move and the church to become what God wants it to be because it will be what he wants it to be. So an elder must be God-focused, kingdom-focused first. And that's an elder that we would be willing to follow, right? Who's kingdom-focused. What would God have us do? Ought to be, I'm a challenge to the elders in our church. That ought to be the question on your lips every day you think about being an elder. That ought to be the question that we start to begin every elders meeting with. What would God have us do? What would God have us concerned with? What of God's business are we to be about here? We ought to call them God's business meetings. That makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? Gives a perspective to it. We're looking for kingdom focused men who will. So this could have been another one. Lead, lead for and feed. And it could have been intercede. Could have been another one. We ought to have shepherds who are interceding for the body of Christ, who are praying for the body of Christ and asking God for wisdom. And so this is why I'm challenging you, church, to pray for them, that they would be prayers, prayers, praying on your behalf. We're looking for kingdom focused men who serve for God's approval, not men's. So that is what a godly leader looks like, a good leader, a good shepherd looks like. Peter's going to shift gears here. And talk about what it looks like to be a good follower. Okay? So who does this apply to? Everyone who claims to be a follower of Jesus hearing my voice. This is for all of us. This is for me. This is for you. Look at verse 5. So he says, young men. So he says, church, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because... God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, and he may lift you up in due time. A good follower is, first of all, humbly submissive. Humble and submissive. There are two extreme reactions when it comes to following, I've noticed. Because I've had both of them, so I can share that with you. One is to say, well, I'm a lot smarter than this guy. Why is he in charge? <laughs> right? Maybe you felt that on the job site before, right? Maybe you felt it in church. Maybe you felt it in school. Maybe as a professor at college, you thought, man, I can teach this class. This guy, he can get his PhD from Sesame Street. Yeah. You know, so if you feel that way, you feel arrogant, you know, you, you tend to look down on someone. And, and here's another thing, you distrust leaders, all leaders maybe, because you've been jaded or hurt before. So now you've got this distrust toward anybody who's in a position of authority. Now, on the other hand, you have this far point of just idealistically, you know, uh, saying, wow, this person is just great. Everything they do, and I kind of think back to the time in Bible college, you know, thinking about maybe a professor, like this guy knows everything. I believe everything that he said. Just keep it coming, you know. You know, so you can naively fall into hero worship. You can elevate someone, a, a preacher or a teacher, with just no thought, lightly following. Now, in the center, though, here's where I want us all to land. In the center, here's where we're going to land. Is we realize we live in reality. And there's no perfect person. And we are going to humbly submit to following an imperfect person for the sake of a perfect God. Not blindly, but encouragingly and lovingly and humbly. As each congregation affirms their own leaders just as we have done, 
The congregation then, as members of the local church, choose to honor and submit to their leader's authority. A good follower doesn't resent the leader, doesn't sabotage the leader's direction. Instead, we're going to approach this as, as someone, as a follower, I've got to have an eager spirit to cooperate and to work together. Reminding myself, guess what team we're on? The same team, church. The same team. So I've got to ask myself the question, how can I be a level five follower if I'm not being led by a level five leader? Because the truth is, the world's not filled with level five leaders. So what do I do if I find myself in that situation? Listen, an ego-driven, discontented follower who constantly ridicules a leader behind their back is just going to sow seeds of discord and chaos. There'll be no ground taken by the leaders if followers are always messing things up, right? So as a follower, I've got to be, I've got to be driving the leader, encouraging the leader, praying for the leader. Few things reinforce a leader and strengthen the body of Christ like respectful followers who give evidence of their support. Even though you may not like a leader or get along well, listen, if you come with a humble spirit... It's kind of like a quarterback who's getting excited about the coach's game plan. You know, can you imagine after the, you know, at the huddle, the coach gives the sign. Can you imagine the quarterback go, this ain't going to work, guys. <laughs> How's it going to work? It ain't. <laughs> right? It's kind of like a teacher who's got a principal that might be a little difficult to work with. But instead, the teacher says, you know what? Okay, got this new plan. I'm on board. I'm going I'm to support it. And I'm going to encourage her or him. It's the salesman who endorses the CEO's new direction and says, hey, we're behind you. We're going we're to make this thing successful. So contribution by those kinds of followers is invaluable, isn't it? It's priceless. Remember the movie, Remember the Titans? You remember the movie, Remember the Titans? Yeah. 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 A high school hired the first black coach in the, in the county. The assistant coach who at that time was white and wanted the head coach's job was in a position. He could have made a couple of decisions, couldn't he? He could have undermined the coach. He could have made things miserable on the coach. But instead, he pushed all his chips in to the coach and said, I'm behind you 100%. You're the coach and I'm going to be the best assistant coach that you've got. I'm going to work hard and we're going to have a, a great season. Guess what happened to that football team? They had a winning season and there was racial harmony on that team. So a good follower, sometimes willing, I'm going to swallow my pride and I'm going to humble myself before others. And God honors that. Next, a good follower is divinely strengthened. Look at the next verse, verse 7. Cast all your anxieties on God. Why? Because He cares for you. You might need to underline that one. It's a great verse. Cast all your anxieties on God because He cares for you. A level 5 follower isn't somebody who's going around just take, dumping their problems and their mess on other people. Yes, the Bible says that we're to help carry one another's burdens, right? I've got burdens, you've got burdens, and it's my job to help you carry your burdens and your job to help me carry my burdens. But look, if I'm overburdening people all the time, I'm just going to be making a mess wherever I go. And maybe you know somebody like that. But they're always talking about their problem or their struggle or their pain or their... And that's all you hear from them. It's discouraging, isn't it? Always complaining about personal issues or, or fretting about the future constantly. It's going to be draining on everybody around you. Peter encourages us, put your trust in God in this significant way. Next, next, next one is the good follower is fully engaged. Look at verse 8. Be sober-minded or self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. 
Resist him. Standing firm in the faith. You know what I find ironic? It's not ironic at all, but it just strikes me funny is that in this, that Peter's writing this and Peter knows better than anybody else what he's talking about. Remember at the Last Supper? Jesus said, he said, watch out. Satan's going to sift you like wheat, Peter. He's going to sift you like wheat and you're going to deny me, Peter. And Peter's like, what are you talking about? Right? He's like, no way. I'll never deny you, Lord. Only to completely eat crow and fail. Right? Utterly failed. Satan attacked him before he knew it. And he was so disappointed with what he had done. So Peter warns us, hey, look, you've got to take your adversary seriously because your adversary has one motive for your life and that is to destroy it. Right? Jesus said in another place that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Period. He has no good intent for your life. So the stakes are high. Your eternal destiny hangs in the balance here in a way. That you've got to be serious about standing firm, about being, being fully engaged in the gospel. Being, being passionate, being zealous. Look, don't be lukewarm. Don't be partly in, partly out. Don't straddle the fence. Don't be wishy-washy. Jesus says, get on the boat or get off. Right? Get in the game or get out. You can't put your hand to the plow in service of the kingdom of God and look back wishing you could have the old life again. You've got to be all in, fully engaged, Jesus says. So start living out your faith and kicking sin habits out of your life. Start resisting those temptations, those temptations that Satan is throwing at you. All right, next, a good follower is mutually inspired. What I mean by that, well, look at verse 9. Resist Satan, stand firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. We're on the home stretch here, listen to this. There are Christians who know exactly what it's like to struggle with the things you struggle with. Right? What did Paul say? No temptation seized you except that which is common to man. Other people struggle and other people have the, you know, if you're ashamed of something and you know that you need to confess a sin or you need to confide in a brother or sister, don't be ashamed because you're not the only one. You're not the only one. And look, if you're going through a hurting situation or you are, you are disappointed or discouraged or you're de depressed and you need to talk to somebody, don't be ashamed about it. Because there are other believers who have been in your shoes and you can look at those believers. When you find out a believer who's been victorious and they've struggled with things, that doesn't give you hope. It gives me confidence and courage to keep going. And maybe you've been victorious and you can be an, an, an inspiration to somebody else. Then do that. Encourage others. And, and Peter says, look, around the world, there are brothers and sisters going through far worse stuff than what we're going through. Sure, we might be quarantined. Sure, we might have this COVID situation. Sure, we might have these things. Whatever you put in that, that spot, fill in the blank. There are believers who are hard pressed on every side around the globe. You should take heart in their faith. And you should, we should seek to encourage them and pray for them. Last one, write this down. A good follower is eternally motivated. Look at verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you've suffered a little while, because you're guaranteed to have suffering in this world, he says, look, he will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Don't you like to be encouraged? Amen. We all need it sometimes, don't we? I want to tell you, Christian, it's amazing what your encouragement will do for someone else. 
You might not even know the ramifications of your encouragement in somebody's life. We all like to be boosted up, don't we? We all like a little, little encouragement, recognition, or appreciation. And it can go a long way. Maybe somebody can say, you know, I'm about ready to throw in the towel. But you came along and encouraged me. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep pressing on because of what you said. You might not ever even hear that. But it may happen. So keep doing your best, not for the praise of men, but for the glory of God. Look what Colossians 3 says. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as, for, as working for the Lord, not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. There's your motivation, Christian. You're serving Jesus. Above all else. So children. Obey your parents. Even if you don't feel appreciated at times. Because you got a heavenly father. Who sees. And rewards you. Wives. Respect your husbands. Even if they don't always make it easy on you. Even if they're not as loving or as, or as considerate as they should be. Because you're honoring a groom who loves you more than they do. Student, respect your teachers. Even if you feel like you know more than they do, right? Even if they don't give you that good grade that you think you should have gotten. Because you are serving a rabbi who is great in you. And is poised to honor you. Employees, support your supervisor, even if they're harsh or have unrealistic expectations, because you are serving God and He's keeping separate record books. And you're serving Him above them anyway. Citizens, that's all of us. We do our best to respect our governing authorities, including the police, not because they never abuse their power, because sometimes they do, and not because they aren't corrupt, because a lot of them are, but here's why, because they've been appointed by the Lord, and we honor the Lord when we honor them, even when it's hard. Church members, be willing to defer to the leaders of our church, not because you agree with everything, not because you know more... You, they know more than you do, but because you honor the chief shepherd who will reward you when he comes with your inheritance. Amen. Hebrews 13, 17, obey your leaders and submit to their authority. Look, here's an elder's job. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. There is the sobering reality of their position. They will stand before the judgment throne of God and give an account for how they oversaw the body of Christ. Obey them so that their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would be of no advantage to you. The ultimate leader and shepherd said this in John 10, My sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice and they follow me. I know them. I know them. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. No savage wolf. No depressing circumstance. No loss. No pain. No struggle. No heartache. Will snatch you out of his hand. So stay in his hand. Rest in His grace and trust in His providence. Because the Lord is your shepherd, you shall not want it. And He leads you beside quiet waters. He restores your soul. Let's pray. Father in heaven, hate to admit it because it's it's not that honoring in a way 
being called sheep. But that is what we are. God, we're stubborn and we're helpless at times. We wonder. We get ourselves in trouble and we're vulnerable to attacks more than we even realize. No matter how strong we think we are, Satan prowls like a roaring lion seeking to devour us, Lord. And it's only when we are in the, your care, Father, that we are truly safe and secure. Doesn't mean bad things don't come. Doesn't mean there won't be difficult situations. It doesn't mean the wolf won't break into the flock, Father. But it does mean that you're a shepherd who is there and who cares and who knows. The chief shepherd who is coming again. And Father, we say, come Lord Jesus, come. Because we are excited about being in your presence, Lord. And being safe and secure forever. Father, in the meantime, while we're here, help us to lead well. Help us to follow well. As we follow hard after the one who gave everything for us. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Now, before we take our Lord's Supper this morning, I want to also say to you that if you've got a decision to make for Christ, if you've never been baptized into Christ and you have that decision to make, make sure to write that on your communication card or come and see me right after church today. I want to talk to you about that. Uh, this morning, I want to invite Ron Browning up to be with me this morning. And talking about somebody who follows hard after Jesus, uh, Ron is an inspiration to me and to many. Thankful for his friendship and uh, for his, his whole family. I knew his son a long time before I knew him. And kind of neat how God brings things full circle and uh, uh, blessed by your family. So and your Amen. dear wife, Bobby, and very thankful. And uh, so Ron today has come and said, I'm all in uh, to be uh, a lead follower here at uh, Southwest. So we're going to welcome him. So just, just as a, kind of our protocol, because I'm missing a better word. But, uh, you know, you've already proven your faith for many years, faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But to our body of Christ, um, I'll have you repeat the great confession that Peter uh, gave. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Lord and Savior. The Lord and Savior. Right. From my heart. Yeah. And we know that. So as we prepare our hearts for communion together, I pray that we are uh, united in spirit and that we are united around the cross because that is our only hope. And uh, so remember there is a juice and bread in each individual cup and just go to your closest station after the meditation this morning. Ephesians, the second chapter. <clears throat> Too much stuff in my Bible. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath, but because of the great love of, of us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. 
even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up, uh, raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages He might show the in, uh, incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God. And that's, that's the whole thing in a nutshell. I mean, it, it really is. And uh, it's just an awesome thing that we gather here every Sunday. For that reason. And uh, I hope that I can live up to the path that Nathan laid down today. Amen. I really do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and, and uh, just listen to your word preached this morning in a very challenging way. And uh, Jesus, Jesus set the way for us to go. And we need to follow Him in a very loving and strong way. No matter what part we might do to help the church here, let us do it in a just in a great way. Father, we love You and we just we just want to be your children. We want to be obedient children. We want to be challenged children. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Jesus and the price that he paid for our salvation. For it's in His name that I pray. Amen. Well, it's good to be here to worship the Lord together. Amen? Amen. It's good to fellowship with the body. And, and uh, remember that we are not uh, Lone Ranger Christians. We need one another, don't we? Uh, we need one another. 
And uh, so I, I pray that God bless you and be with you this week. And remember, if there's uh, anything you want to talk about about Jesus, uh, my office is always open. My phone is always on. And I'd love to talk more about your relationship with Jesus. Uh, let's go ahead and stand as we close in worship today. I'm going to have a word of prayer and then we're going we're to sing our hearts out as we, as we leave today. Father in heaven, God is good together in your name. Good together for the purpose of lifting your name up, of honoring you with our lives and with our voices. And Father, I pray that your word will find its fallen on fertile soil today on our hearts. And that we would be ready and willing to go and do so that we might be more like our Savior. To follow in his steps as he left a perfect example for us. Father, we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>